Um, I don't think anyone's introducing me, so I should probably introduce myself. Um, I'm Fred. Uh, now, I uh, first studied acupuncture in Boston, in the US, starting in 1980 with an old Chinese fellow by the name of Tin Yao So, who started the first acupuncture school in the US and had studied acupuncture in China in the 1930s, so before the TCM model had been developed. And then my next teacher was Ted Kapchuk. So this was the first person really explaining about TCM theory in the West. So in the second year of studies, after learning all of these, different, these two different systems of practice, but lots and lots of lectures, in the second year of study we started needling each other. Some of you have heard this story before, but uh, we started needling each other. It's like, oh, finally we're going to do something. And I discovered, much to my horror, that every time I was needled, I fainted. And after a while, I started thinking, how am I ever going to practice acupuncture? Because I don't like it. It doesn't feel nice. And then this Japanese woman, Kiko Matsumoto, turned up in the second year. She did a Friday evening lecture. And when she demonstrated needling, I gave her my hands to needle. And I didn't faint. So I've been doing Japanese acupuncture ever since. Um, this class is listed on the Japanese acupuncture, but actually I'm, I think the theme of what I'm going to cover is much broader than just Japanese acupuncture. Um, I'm a practitioner of Japanese acupuncture. I uh, practice it, teach it more than 30 years now. But I'm going to be quoting mostly the Chinese classics and then showing you how my Japanese teachers put those historical ideas into practice. So it's not really, in a way, I'm more talking about Japanese acupuncture, historical understanding of acupuncture, things like this. And um, normally when I teach, I do a lecture demonstration and then we break into groups and practice. I don't think that's going to happen here. <laughs> it's a little bit tight. Um, standing diagnosis is interesting when you do abdominal palpation. Um, Needling on the feet is also interesting. Anyway, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this lecture, which I've done a few times before, and I will do a couple of demonstrations here, because I want you to, uh, I'm going to demonstrate some needling techniques, and then I'm going to also explain the, how each of the aspects that go into that needling technique are, are based in references in the Suan and Ling Shou and Nanjing, and we'll show all of that, okay? So it's going to be a lot of talk with a little bit of demonstration. And um, I do Japanese acupuncture because it's more sensitive. I don't feel the needle. I don't have to faint, right? I'm going to do some needling techniques where the needles are not actually inserted. That's an even bit more of a ra even more radical concept. So as I discuss today about uh, needling and so on, um, talk about the, what, what kind of things are important to improve yourself as a practitioner. Um, uh, I will also touch on, we'll look at what the historical texts talk about when they talk about things like do qi, and then we'll look at how, what does that mean in practice. If you read the historical Chinese, not the modern text, but the, the first texts. But to make sense out of all of this, I'm, I, I feel it's very important to go back and look at the beginning of all of this, because um, I'm not just trying to sell a book which I'm finishing right now, but also because I think that the, the purpose of doing acupuncture in the earliest descriptions of acupuncture were different than we kind of have made it into today. It had, they had a much, much simpler idea, and their very simple ideas were very difficult to enact, to do. The descriptions of needling was quite sophisticated and complicated in the early literature, but the ideas themselves behind it are very simple, um, and those ideas evolved over time from traditions of thinking that preceded the early medical literature. So. Um, as I look at the needling descriptions, I think it's also important to talk about the source of why are we doing this? What is it that they said you should do with a needle? And why are we doing this? Okay, So that requires that we go back in time a little bit, very briefly. I won't dwell on it too long. Um, 
At the moment, I'm in the middle of finishing a book with a couple of Spanish colleagues, an edited book about Qi and the Jingmai, which is really an ambitious project. But we're able to do it because there's a huge amount of scholarship available now in the last 15 years that wasn't available before. And we can say much more useful and in, we can make much better guesses about what kind of things were going on, what did they mean by this stuff, etc. So because of working on that book, therefore, I have all of these details. Okay. Um, so the, the purpose of doing acupuncture in the historical literature, um, there's uh, we can imagine, the. of course, you put a needle in a patient because you want to make their symptoms better. Of course. But that's not what the early literature was really focusing on. The early literature was more interested in trying to do something to improve the health status of a patient because the early acupuncture literature was a kind of a follow-on from these uh, pre-existing Yangsheng traditions where the individual is responsible by doing certain practices for maintaining their health.